So this afternoon, we are returning to our series on Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Last fall, we covered chapters, last fall, last year, chapters 1 through 8. And in chapters 1 through 8, what Paul does is spell out the good news of Jesus Christ, that even though we've all turned our backs on God, walked away from Him, that's what the Bible calls sin, so even though we've all sinned and face God's judgment forever as a result, in great love and breathtaking mercy, God sent Jesus, His Son, just like we sung about tonight, to die on the cross paying for all the sins of everyone who will put their trust in Him. And because of what Jesus has done, and because we're trusting Him, that means all of God's promises are true for us. And Paul gives amazing promises, lists many, many of them in Romans chapter 1 through 8. For example, Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amazing. Freedom from all of God's punishment, from all condemnation. Romans 8 verse 1. Paul promises, or God promises through Paul, that no trial, no difficulty, no sickness, no death, no person can separate those who are trusting Christ from God's love now and forever. God's love is at work in every trial, difficulty we face to bring us great good in Him. And one last promise, that the Holy Spirit dwelling in us at the end of history will raise us from the dead with new resurrection bodies to be face to face with our Savior, having our hearts filled with the joy of beholding His love, His beauty, His justice, His power, His tenderness, His mercy, His Godhood. Beautiful. Amazing promises. Romans 1 through 8. And Paul wants to spell out how trusting those promises will transform our lives. So we love our enemies, so we rejoice in trials. He wants to spell out all the different ways that those promises transform our lives, but he doesn't get to that until chapter 12. Between chapter 8 and chapter 12, there's chapters 9 through 11. And he has to do chapters 9 through 11 to answer an objection that Paul has heard many rays to what he has been saying, an objection that he's heard from the unbelieving Jews as he's preached to them. See, Paul would go into synagogues, city after city, and he would preach, Gentiles, Jews, we've all sinned against God, we all need to be saved. But the Jewish leaders would often raise their hand and object, wait a minute, Paul, we're born in the line of Abraham. God promised that every child of Abraham, every ethnic Israelite is saved because they're Jews. If what you're saying is right, then you're saying God's word has failed. God's word is wrong because he promised that every Jew is saved. And you're saying that we're not saved yet. This is a massive objection that Paul had to raise because if their objection is true, if what Paul is saying shows that God's word has failed, that God's promise has failed, that means that those beautiful promises in Romans chapter 1 through 8 maybe have failed. If God's promises to his people has failed, then God's promises to all of us in Romans 1 through 8 could have failed as well. That's why Paul can't jump right from chapter 8 to chapter 12. That's why he has to dig into chapters 9 through 11 first. And what these chapters are going to show us is that God's word has not failed. God's promises have not failed. Every promise God has made to his people, he has kept to the word, completely fulfilled. That's Romans 9 through 11. That's where we're going. Ready to go? Let's go. So how does Paul set the stage for this topic? That's verses 1 through 3. Starts off in verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul is heartbroken 
over his people, the people of Israel. He says he has great sorrow. This isn't just a little bit of sorrow. This is big sorrow. Massive sorrow is in his heart. And he says he has unceasing anguish. It's not just temporary or occasional. This is always in his heart. Always great sorrow and unceasing anguish. Now, why? Why did Paul feel this heartbroken sorrow and anguish for the people of Israel? We see the answer in verse 3. He says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What that means is that Paul is saying the vast majority of Israel, the vast majority of, of the people of Israel, Jewish people, are accursed and cut off from Christ. Cut off from Christ means cut off from all of his saving benefits. And because of that, they are accursed, which is the Greek word anathema, which means judged, found guilty, facing God's punishment forever. Broke Paul's heart. Paul, and I've had a hard time trying to wrap my mind around this, but Paul says he loves his people so much that if it were possible, he would face God's judgment himself so they could be saved. Of course, it's not possible. God has not set up the world so that somebody can face God's judgment so somebody else can be saved. That's not how it works. Jesus is the one who does that. None of us. But this shows us how heartbroken Paul is for his people, how much he loves them. I mean, he would go into synagogue after synagogue after synagogue. He'd, he'd be preaching the gospel. He would be beaten. He would be uh, scourged. He would be stoned. And he'd be back the next day preaching again and again and again, being beaten. I mean, he, he was relentless. He loved his people. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, but the first place it seems like he always went was to the synagogues. Intense sorrow over how the people of Israel are accursed and cut off from Christ. Now, Paul wants us, the readers, to feel more of that sorrow as well. And that's what Paul does in the next couple of verses. How does Paul help us feel this sorrow? He does this by listing eight blessings that God has given to the people of Israel. I try to think of an illustration so you can see what, what Paul's doing. Imagine that you knew or heard of a young man, maybe late 20s, who tragically robs a bank and then is arrested, convicted, and sentenced to, say, 25 years in jail. Life just destroyed. You'd feel some sense of the tragedy of that, don't you? What a sad thing. But think of how your tragedy would increase if you heard that his parents loved him. His parents poured their lives out for him. His parents blessed him with instruction, blessed him with training, blessed him with schooling, taught him, loved him, spent time with him, encouraged him, supported him, cared for him, blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And can you feel how with each blessing, the sense of tragedy of what this young man's done has grown? You feel that? That's what Paul's doing here. He lists eight blessings that God has given to the people of Israel who now are accursed and cut off from Christ. So we will feel the tragedy of their situation. The eight blessings are found in verses 4 through 5. Let's read those verses. Paul says, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Let's go through these one at a time. First, adoption. 
God offered them to be adopted into his family where he, the God of the universe, would be their loving, caring, faithful father. Offered them to be adopted into God's family. Second, the glory. You read through the Old Testament. There's times where God allows his people to see and feel the, the glorious presence of God, like, like in the temple, God pours his glory out upon them, and, the, and the, the priests can't minister because they're just overwhelmed with the, the wonderful presence of God. The greatest joy any human being can experience is the glory of God, and God offered them his glory, he gave them tastes of it throughout their history. Third, the covenants. Covenants, many covenants through the Old Testament where God says, Here's all the different things I'm going to do for you. Long list of promises. This, 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 this. Trust me and follow me. These will all be yours. Gave them his covenants. They weren't interested for the most part. Fourth, the giving of the law. God's law, the Old Testament. First five books. You've got history there of God's faithfulness. We've got commands that are given. We've got promises that are given. We've got God's wisdom in, in the scriptures. God gave his law like we saw in Psalm 119 last week. Remember, the psalmist says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. It's worth more to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces because what comes through the law is the life of God filling our souls, the strength of God, the hope that God has for us, the peace, the joy, the glory. This all comes to us through the scriptures. God gave them the law. Fifth, the worship. God's glory is our greatest joy, and worshiping God is how we see and feel his glory like we have done tonight so far. God invited Israel, worship me. You'll be filled with the joy of my presence. Sixth, the promises. God offered his promises to the people of Israel. Forgiveness of sins. Heart-filling joy in God's presence that he's going to rejoice over them to do them good with all his heart and all his soul. That They will trust him, turn to him. Promise after promise after promise he gave to them. Is, is your sense of the tragedy of this rising? Remember, they are now accursed and cut off from Christ. Got two more. Seventh, to them belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could read the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Men who weren't perfect, but who trusted God, and God was perfectly faithful to each of them, even in miraculous ways. God gave them the patriarchs to learn from. Trust me, God is saying. They walked away. And then eighth, the pinnacle, the climax. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. See, throughout the Old Testament, God had promised that he was going to send the Messiah who would pay for sin and pour out the Holy Spirit upon all who put their trust in him. And notice, Paul says here that the Christ, the Messiah, is God. Underline that in your Bibles. God over all. The Messiah, Jesus, was and is and will be fully man and fully God. Fully God along with God the Father, who is fully God, and God the Spirit, who is fully God. Now remember, that doesn't mean there are three gods. There is one God in three persons. But this is very clear that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is fully God. And God honored the people of Israel in an astonishing way. The Messiah he had promised for all those years, the Messiah who would take away the sins of the world, the Messiah God in the flesh, this baby who'd be fully God, was born from the people of Israel. What an honor. What a privilege. Mary and Joseph knew it was a privilege. John and Elizabeth knew it was going to be a privilege to Mary and Joseph. But most of Israel at that point had walked away from the Messiah. Eight astonishing blessings. 
And yet, in spite of all these blessings, for the most part, the people of Israel had walked away, turned away to sin. They kept being Jewish outwardly, culturally, right? You read about that in the Gospels. But they had no interest in God inwardly, emotionally, spiritually. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you honor God with your mouths, your words, but your hearts are far from him. So outwardly and culturally, yes, but not inwardly, personally. And so as a result, they were accursed and cut off from Christ. They were not saved. That's why Paul felt great sorrow and unceasing anguish. But the Jewish leaders, wait a minute, Paul, hold it. Paul, if you're right and we're not saved, then God's word has failed because God told us in his word, he promised in his word that we are God's chosen people. We are God's saved chosen people. And that's the objection that Paul has to address in these next chapters. But let's dig more deeply into that. Why would that make God's word fail? Why? I want us to feel the, the weightiness of this objection a little bit more. Why would that make God's word fail? The answer is in verse 6. If we read it carefully, look at what Paul says. He says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. The word of God has not failed. Are we all clear on that? We're talking about this is a Jewish objection. This is not what the truth is. The word of God has not failed. Why? For not all who are descended from Israel, belong to Israel. See, they were saying that the Word of God has failed because they misunderstood what the Old Testament had taught. Jews and Gentiles, we are all, before we're saved, a terribly proud people. Gentiles are, Jews are, same, okay? And in their pride, they misinterpreted the Old Testament scriptures to think that just because I'm an ethnic Jew, I'm God's people, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I don't need to be saved. God told me I'm his, I'm saved. So Paul, if you're saying that I'm not saved, then you're saying God's word has failed. Let me show you how this is what the Jews believed. Look at Luke chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. John the Baptist is preaching here. Crowds are coming out to be baptized. And listen to what John the Baptist said. Verse 7, Luke 3. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's the only way you're going to avoid the wrath to come. Repent, be saved, bear fruits in keeping with your repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, as if that gets them off the hook. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, we're good, we're, we're saved. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. See, John the Baptist knows that the people coming to him, many of them do not think they need to repent to be saved, because Abraham is their father. They think that because Abraham is their father, they're automatically saved, forgiven. They don't need to worry about that. Unbelieving Israel thought that God had promised that every ethnic Jew was saved. But Paul said that everyone, Jew and Gentile, needs to be saved. So, as far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, Paul's teaching means that God's word has failed. It means that God, God's word has not kept his promise. God has not kept his promise. Again, now, let this weigh on you. Feel the weight of this. If God has not kept his promise to Israel, then we have no confidence that God will keep his promise to us. The promises in Romans 1 through 8 are maybe. God might keep them, they might fail. God might break his promise if he broke the promise to Israel. 
Think about what this means. God said, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If God's word has failed, then maybe there is condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God said that no trial, no difficulty can separate us from God's love in Christ. Maybe there are trials that can come that will separate us entirely from God's love in Christ. Paul had said that God promised that the Spirit dwelling in us will raise us from the dead. What if he won't? So do you feel what's at stake? This is why Paul can't run to write to Romans chapter 12. He's got to do chapters 9 through 11 first. If God promised that every ethnic Israelite was saved, and Paul is right that the vast majority are not saved, then God's word has failed. So what's Paul's answer? We've been hoping we get here. Here we are. What is Paul's answer? Why has God's word not failed? End of verse 6. Read the whole verse to get the flow of thought. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Think of a big, big circle, ethnic Israel, okay? Paul's saying, not all ethnic Israel are saved Israel. Okay, you got the big circle of ethnic Israel, but there's a smaller group that are saved Israel. Yes, some are saved, praise the Lord, but not every ethnic Israelite is saved. There's a small circle of those who are saved. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to saved Israel. So being born as a physical child of Abraham does not automatically save you. So what does save you? What does save you? This is what Paul explains through chapter 9 and 10 and 11 as well. Now, some of you might be surprised at the answer Paul gives here. This might not be what you're expecting. Because we expect Paul to say, and Paul is right to say, that we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That is absolutely right. Only way we can be saved. Faith in Jesus Christ. No one can be saved without choosing to put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, as their treasure. You must trust Christ to be saved. Yes. But in Romans 9, Paul wants to go deeper. Picture faith right here. Paul wants to say there's something underneath faith. There's something that produced your faith. There's something that supports and carries your faith. There's something more ultimate to your salvation than your faith. Your faith is absolutely necessary. No one gets saved without faith. But let's dig deeper here in Romans chapter 9. What's beneath that? What brings about our faith in Christ? What is under, supporting, strengthening our faith in Christ? And Paul tells us in verse 16, I'm going to jump ahead a couple of verses here in Romans 9. So you'll see the full picture of where Paul is going. Look at what Paul says, Romans 9, verse 16. He says, So then it, and he's referring to the mercy of salvation, God's saving mercy. You can see that in the previous verses. So then it, God's saving mercy, depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So not only does our salvation not depend on our racial background, Paul is saying our salvation does not come ultimately from anything in us. It doesn't come ultimately from anything in us, not our race, not anything we will, not anything we put exertion into accomplishing. Our salvation doesn't come from anything ultimately in us. Our salvation comes ultimately from God, who chooses to have mercy on us. It starts with God, who, because of Jesus' death on the cross paying for sin, set his affection on you. That's why you're trusting him tonight, because he set his love upon you, set his affection upon you, and changed your heart, and gave you faith, and gave you repentance. That did not come ultimately from you. 
That was a free gift from God. Now, I, I know that this might be a new thought for some of you. For some, others of you, maybe not, but for some of you, I'm sure it's a new thought. And um, bear with me. I want to give you one more scripture to back this up that you could be thinking about over these next weeks. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Very well-known verses. And I want you to see that that's exactly what Paul is saying here also. Romans 9, 16 is repeated in different words in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is so important for us to understand. We want to go deeper, even deeper than our faith is what saves us. That is absolutely crucial. No one gets saved without faith, but it's important to understand where did that faith come from? Why did I have faith? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul says, For by grace, God's grace, pure grace, you've been saved through faith. There's faith. Absolutely essential. No other way to be saved. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, underline that word, this. It's only in there once, right? Okay, there's one this in, in those verses. Underline this. This is not your own doing. The Greek makes it clear that that word, this, refers to the entire previous statement. It refers to everything in that previous sentence. It refers to grace. This grace is not your own doing. This being saved is not your own doing. And this faith is not your own doing. None of those are your own doing. It's all a gift from God. Did you realize that your faith was a gift from God? He, he gave that to you. Because of Jesus' death, God chose to save you and to change your heart and to give you faith. That's what God does. And this is what we all needed to be saved. Remember Hunter read earlier, very powerful, from Ephesians chapter 2, we were all, what, in sin? Dead in sin. And what did God do? He made us alive. See, we were all in our sinfulness, not wanting to trust Christ. No one in our sinfulness wants to be forgiven and reconciled to God. I don't want God. I'd rather pursue this stuff over here. Thank you. None of us would have chosen to put our trust in Christ if God had just sat back and waited for some of us to choose him. We were dead in sin. If God had waited, nobody would be saved. But God didn't wait. God sent his son. And I want you to think about what this cost for God the Father to send his son and for Jesus the son to come. I want you to feel the grace and the mercy in this. For God the Father to send his son to the horror of the cross, his blameless perfect, beautiful son to the cross to pay for the sins of all who would trust him. What did that cost the father? What did it cost Jesus the son? Well, we get a picture. Remember the garden of Gethsemane as he thought about the physical agonies of tomorrow and far worse, the wrath for sin being poured out upon him. He sweat like drops of blood as he was praying. I want you to think about the cost here. We're talking about grace and mercy. This is what God did. Sent his own son. And it's because Jesus did that, that God could set his love upon you, a sinner, and me, a sinner. When we were running away from him, he set his love upon us and changed our hearts, opened our eyes. We could see the glory, the beauty of Jesus and want him more than anything else and trust him. That's all gifts from God. God gave that to us. 
So no one is saved because of race. Are we, are we clear? That's why God's word has not failed. God did not promise to save every Israelite. God did not promise that everyone born in the line of Abraham would already be saved. What God promised was that he was going to save, as the book of Revelation says, a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, language, and tribe. That's what God's going to do. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing in this city. That's why we're here. He's promised that he will save a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tongue, and tribe. And that's what he's doing. He is fulfilling that promise perfectly. Now, like I said, this, this might be a new thought for some of you, and, and it, it raises maybe some questions. Good. That's a good thing. And as we're going through Romans 9, we're going to be digging deeper and deeper and deeper into this. And, and the Holy Spirit had Paul write Romans 9 because he wants believers to study, learn, understand Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11, because it will strengthen our faith. It will fill us with even more beholding of God's glory. It will humble us before the cross. It will strengthen us in our love for other people. Rich gifts are ours through Romans 9 through 11. But it'll take putting on our thinking caps, like my mom used to say when I was little. Take putting on our thinking caps. When you have questions, either coming up out of your home group discussion, because our home groups are going to be wrestling with this, or your own reading, and I would encourage you to read Romans 9 through 11 on your own, send me your questions to mail at gracechurchabadabi.com. Send them to me. Uh, I will either maybe address them in sermons. I won't mention your name, but I'll just mention the question and, and get some answer, or um, I'll just send you an email maybe with some other resources. There's other people much smarter than me who may, I'm sure have answered many of those questions better than I could. But ask your questions. If you've not thought deeply about this before, this should raise lots of questions. I think the scripture has answers for them. This is why God's word does not fail. It's because God did not promise that every ethnic Israelite would be saved. I mean, isn't that, isn't that obvious? Think about Judas, for example. It's obvious. God did not promise that. That's why God's word does not fail. That's why God's promises do not fail. Now, let me close with one last question. Why is this such good news? There's many reasons, and we're going to be talking about more reasons as we move ahead in, in the weeks to come. But let me give you one reason that I find very precious personally. This teaching that God gave us faith, that, that beneath faith is God's sovereign grace and mercy. That's why I have faith is because of what God did. That teaching is why I can stand before you tonight 100% confident that I will make it to heaven. That's why. Let me explain why I say that. Imagine that the rock-bottom foundation of our Christian life isn't God's sovereign grace, but take that away, but is, is just our faith. It's all about your faith. I want you to think about what that means. Jesus taught, it's the one who perseveres to the end who will be saved, right? Now, if, if your faith is anything like mine, which it is, okay, it's not easy to have faith right? My faith can get weak. I can get tempted to start trusting in that instead of in Jesus. Faith is up and down. Do we all have times where we have weak faith? <clears throat> do we all have times where we are weak in faith? Yes, I, I do. I do. I, every day I'm fighting, and God meets us, but we've got to fight. So the, here's the picture I want you to have. If, if the foundation of your salvation doesn't go any deeper than just your faith. And if Jesus said it's those who persevere to the end who will save your souls, how confident are you going to be that your faith is going to last all the way to the end? I wouldn't be confident knowing my faith. So I hope so. Maybe. You feel that? But I want to tell you, the Bible says we can be absolutely 100% confident that we will be in heaven. 
not because of how strong our faith is, but because underneath that faith is God's sovereign grace and mercy. He gave you the faith. He sustains your faith. He strengthens your faith. He promises the good work I started in you, I will continue until the day of Christ Jesus. Who's going to continue the good work? He will. Now, we work too. We fight the fight of faith. It's not easy. We're striving to enter the kingdom of God. We're trusting Christ. We're praying. We're in the scriptures. We're fighting against sin. But even all those he's giving to us, he's giving to us. Beneath our faith is God's sovereign, gracious mercy. He gives us faith. He sustains our faith. He strengthens our faith. He motivates us to to obey him. He motivates us to fight against sin. And when we do sin, he brings us back. He changes our hearts so we turn back. That's the sign of a saved person. Not that we're sinless, but that we turn back in repentance and faith. So here's what this means for me personally. Right now, by God's grace, I know I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. I have no other plea. If he doesn't save me, I am lost. I know that very well. Trusting him as my Savior. I'm trusting him as my Lord. I think every area of my life is submitted to him that I'm aware of. And I'm trusting him as my treasure. I know he's the joy I'm looking for. Nothing else compares in the slightest bit. I know that there's no area of sin that I'm kind of clutching to. Say, so I'll, I'll give you this, but see, to, to have faith, you, you, you're not sinless, but you've got to lay it all down, right? We've we got to fight every area of sin. Not that you're conquering every area, but you're fighting every area. That's, and that's, that's the case in my heart, and I'm sure most all of our hearts here. But see, if that's happening, then you have saving faith. You really have saving faith. And you didn't come up with that. That was a gift from God. That was God's gracious, sovereign mercy. Because of Christ's death, he set his love upon you and you were running away from him and he changed your heart and brought you back, gave you faith. That faith came from him. It's the best news in the world. And the good work that he started, he promises to continue all the way to heaven. That's how I can know you're going to heaven and that's how you can know you're going to heaven. Two questions to end with. Two sub-questions to that first question. That was the last one. Are you trusting Christ right now? Not are you sinless, but are you surrendering every area of your life to him and, and saying, help me fight this area? Help me not worry about this? Help me not have this greedy... Th- you're, you're fighting. You're not saying, my precious little sin, I'm going to keep this one for me. That is a very dangerous sign. Don't do that. Lay that down right now. Lay it down right now. So are you trusting Christ? Because if you're trusting Christ, and not that your faith is super strong, but you're saying, Jesus, I'm barely hanging on here. Help me. That's beautiful saving faith right there. You understand that? Beautiful saving faith. If you have that, you can be 100% certain tonight that you will be in heaven. And for those of you who came here tonight and you're not you're not trusting Christ. You may be from a different religious background or whatever. We're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. And I'll just appeal to you along these lines. Look at the love that God displayed in sending his own son to die to pay for sin. And look at the love that Jesus displayed in the Garden of Gethsemane as he anticipated going to the cross the next day. There's no love like the love of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit displayed on the the cross. See God's love, the reality of it, the beauty of it, the security of it, the forgiveness of it, and turn and trust Christ now. You'll be forgiven for all your sins. God will pour his love into your heart, and you can be 100% certain that you will be in heaven with him, full of joy forever. Let's stand. Father, thank you that when we were dead in our sins, you, because of Christ and your mercy, made us alive. 
All those who are trusting you in this room, you've made us alive. We were dead. You made us alive. That by grace, we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. What a gift. Lord, I pray for those here who are not yet trusting Christ. Lord, right now, open their eyes to see your love, to see who you are, and to trust the Savior, Jesus. Grant it, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.